Hello there. Welcome to No Extra Words, One Person's Search for Story. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. This is season two, Book Pairings. This episode, which I'm releasing, Lord Willing and the Creek Don't Rise, May 29th, 2018, marks my third anniversary of podcasting. And as any of you who've been following the journey, and some of you have been following it for quite some time, you know who you are. Thank you. A lot has happened in those three years, and the show as it is today looks very different. And we've done celebrations of anniversaries in the past, but I wanted to celebrate this differently. I wanted to celebrate this rather than by doing some of the reaching out that we've done in the past and finding people to interview and finding back issues that you guys like the best and things like that. I wanted to celebrate more by going in and getting personal. I don't shy away from talking about myself on this show, but I think in the last couple of months, one of the things that has been happening is it's been becoming more of the Chris show. And I don't mind that so much because I think this journey of reading and storytelling that we're on is very personal. And so I wanted to get into the Wayback Machine today and tell you a story about a little girl named Christy and how she came to fall in love with books and libraries. And the best way that I know to tell you her story is by talking to you about two fictional little girls, both named Betsy. And this episode, I think, is going to mark the beginning of a journey we're going to take together this summer through the books of my childhood, and I'm hoping you'll come along with us. So stay tuned to the end to find out how that is going to come to be. I am a librarian. I've been working in libraries since I got my first library job at 25 in 2004. That's actually not true. I got my first library job at 24 in 2000 and late 2002 as a bookshelver for the local library system where I grew up. But I got my first sort of real frontline library service job at 25 in 2004. That was when I became the storytime lady for the first time. And in the years since then, I have been a youth services librarian, I've been a teen librarian, a school librarian, a substitute librarian, an outreach librarian, and various points in between. So bottom line, I've staffed my share of reference desks in small towns and downtowns and pretty much everywhere in between. Don't know everything, haven't seen everything, but libraries and I are familiar at this point. In the years since 2004, I'm counting in my head. I've worked for, I'm on my fourth library system that I've worked for here in the area. But one of them I worked for twice at two different times and at two different levels. So um, I've done a lot of different things in libraries since that time, not quite 15 years ago. Well, working in libraries was, if I'm honest, a fortuitous accident born of a supervisor who took a chance on me. Thank you, Vicky, if you're out there. But my relationship with libraries goes way back before that. So my hometown, a hundred years ago, was a tiny little agricultural farm town and has grown into this sprawling traffic-filled suburb. If you hear about it today, it's probably because it's the home of the biggest fair in the West. Google that. Also, it has its fair share of car dealerships. It's kind of that sort of place. By the time I was growing up there, the suburban sprawl was starting to happen, and it had separated itself into these two distinct areas. So there was this cute, old-timey downtown, which is the valley, and then there were was this kind of sprawling suburb, the hill, that was full of new developments and is full of newer ones all the time. And that division existed not just culturally, but also politically and in library land, because those of us on the Hill at that time were outside the city limits. So we were in this county library system. So my library was a small rented space in a strip mall next to an ice cream shop. The library itself was small, but it was part of this big county system. So we could actually get a lot of books sent in. And I was pretty young when I learned to do that by myself, because the library pretty early on adopted this computer system. So you'd use keyboard shortcuts to find books. And, you know, I remember PH was placehold and SO was start over and so on. 
So you could do it yourself and have things sent to you. But my dad worked downtown, and that address gave us access to the city's library as well. And that's a place that really felt like a library. It was built in the 50s or 60s. I remember it as being huge, which it wasn't. But you have to remember, I was used to the library in the strip mall. And dark. It had this sort of cavernous library quality to it. It's been rebuilt since that time, and while I'm sure there are pictures of it somewhere, as it looked then, really all I have to go by is my memories. But I remember that it felt and it smelled like a library should, and it was always cold in there, even in August. So the city library had history, and it had size, but it was also part of the city's budget, so it always had a funding problem. It was a lot slower to upgrade and modernize than the county system was. And so my memory of that library when I was a child is you would walk in the door and you'd be immediately faced with this long row right inside the entrance of these old school blonde wood card catalogs. And I can remember a couple of times my mom actually pulled drawers out and showed me how to find books on subjects if we were reading them that particular week. And so I do remember that experience of the old school library and the old cards. Now, this is the point where I could do a giant aside and talk to you all about library catalogs and the Dewey Decimal System, but I don't want this episode to go on forever, so I'm going to skip that just now. I do want to do it, though, so I'm kind of working on an idea of like a special behind-the-scenes-in-libraries episode. If you'd be interested in hearing that at all, let me know, because I kind of started writing it and might put it out in the next couple weeks, just because I think it's an interesting aside. But I'm going to keep it out of this conversation. But starting this episode with my early relationship with libraries is very intentional, because I was a very early reader, and I was a voracious reader. And there's always that question, right? Are readers born or are we made? Because some of my affinity towards books was a product of my environment. My parents are both teachers, so I come from a highly educated family, and there are always books around, and there are always stories being read. And so there's a naturalness to my relationship with books that is kind of bred into where I come from. That said, nobody in my family, I don't think, has the same relationship with books that I do. Everybody's on good terms with relationships, so we definitely have some bookworms in my family. My nephew can go through novel after novel after novel, but... I think it is fair to say that the relationship I have with books that was born in the early days of being surrounded by reading material and regularly taken to the library and all those influences that can help kids be readers has deepened because of literary influences in my life. Which is one of the reasons I've created this season of the show is because I wanted to explore that. I actually learned to read it for which is interesting to me now because I have a four-year-old who really, really, really wants to read. He's so chomping at the bit. I just turned four-year-old. And so I wonder if we have another early reader in the making. But by six years old, I was driving my mother insane. My mom always was a reader and always had a close relationship with books. And as a child, it's really her more than anyone else in my family that I remember sharing this close relationship with books with. My dad didn't read a lot of books when I was growing up. He read the paper every day, but he was working so hard that I just think he lacked the time and maybe the mental capacity. And now in retirement, he goes through books like they're going out of style. But as a child, I remember my mom was the one who came closest to understanding my relationship with books. But nobody went through books the way I did. And keeping me in books was driving my mother crazy. I know I've mentioned this before, but I went through all the Little House books the year before I started kindergarten, the summer before I started. And I would check out a stack of picture books and easy readers and finish them in days or sometimes hours. And my mom's struggle was finding books for me to read that would last me longer than a day, but that the content didn't just go flying right over my head. I would have had no trouble going through a lot of classic literature. But at that point in my life, the difference between what I could read, or reading history would say decode, like actually understand the words of, and what my six-year-old brain was actually capable of empathizing with or understanding in terms of story, that was, there was a big gap between those two things. And so in desperation, my mom turned to the librarian at that strip mall library for help, and she put into my hands 
B is for Betsy by Carolyn Haywood. And it turned out there were a dozen books in that series. And they kept me going, at least for a little while, during that year that I was in first grade. And being introduced to Betsy also introduced me to the idea that there were people out there who could recommend books. And so a few years later, when I was in another reading lull, a different librarian, I think this may have been one of the downtown library, handed me Betsy Tacey by Maud Hart Lovelace. And I took that recommendation and figured out to all by myself put holds on and read through that entire series of 10 books. There are a lot of book series that became a part of my first half dozen years of reading life and really are part of my DNA as a reader. Ramona has to be in there, L. Frank Baum's Oz books, of course, Little House, as I've mentioned before. But those two girls named Betsy and their associated lives and worlds live large. And somewhere between the two of them is when I turned from an early reader into a bookworm. So I went back and revisited both of those books to prepare for this episode. I don't think I had read Haywood's Betsy since then, and I had not read the first of the Betsy Tacey series in a long time, although I have read through those books more, especially the later ones. Talk a little bit more about that series in a little bit. I learned a lot as I went on this sojourn through the books of my childhood about what you can go back to, what is worth revisiting, and when books are just for a particular point in life. I was actually surprised that it's so easy to find B is for Betsy. I figured those would be long gone out of print and hard to track down. B is for Betsy was originally published in 1939, and I really didn't think it had the staying power to still be around. But while I did find a 1939 copy that I actually ended up reading for this project, and I found that in an antique store, you can get Betsy pretty easily. The first four were re-released by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt in 2004, and they're widely available. They have these modern-looking covers. They sort of look Judy Moody-esque, which I think was a mistake by the publisher, because to any modern kid picking up Betsy, she's going to feel really old-fashioned and very far away from what they're used to seeing. That isn't a terrible thing, but I think the covers are confusing in that regard. But they're out there. You can get them. So the first four have been reissued. There were originally 12, and they were published, there's a long swing on here, they were published between 1939 and 1977, so almost 40 years. And I actually was wondering before I took on this project if Carolyn Haywood might have been some kind of invention, you know, like like Carolyn Keene of Nancy Drew or Franklin W. Dixon of the Hardy Boys. In case you didn't know, neither of those people actually exist. They're made up. The names were created And then the writing of those books was farmed out to staff writers in-house at the publisher. So those are fake people. And I was wondering if Carolyn Haywood was a fake person, too. And I went to look her up, and that's when things got weird. There's almost no information about Carolyn Haywood or the Betsy series on the internet. Almost none. Okay, that may not sound weird to you, but here's the thing. Children's book people are kind of nutty. Those books have a lasting impact on them. And so with most children's book series, if you look, you'll find book clubs and societies and people who go visit the places where these things were written or written about, and they collect things and they write letters to their favorite authors. And there are lots of people who keep, especially for those long and complicated series, detailed websites that have synopsis and orders. And if there's spinoffs, what order they come in and where you should read them in. Betsy gets zero of that. There is none of that out there for this particular B is for Betsy, Betsy. None. When you search for Carolyn Haywood, here's what you get. The world's blandest Wikipedia page. A couple of lists of her selected and collected works, none of which are complete that I could tell. Her 1990 obituary in the New York Times, which hits the highlights of her career and indicates that she didn't leave an heir. And a two-part blog series from the Free Library of Philadelphia, which we'll get to in a minute. There's certainly some folks writing good reviews on Goodreads and that kind of stuff, but no one has taken the time to make book lists, put the series in order, or even put her full bibliography on her Wikipedia page. None of that. It's bizarre. 
I've never seen so little information about children's author in my life. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, because of course, these are really old books. But remember, they were at least popular enough as late as 2004, that they merited reissue. So they've never really been out of print. I mean, Carolyn Keene gets a much longer Wikipedia entry. And remember, she didn't even exist. It's weird. Now, I don't want to make the mistake of overestimating Carolyn Haywood's impact on literary society. We are definitely not talking about Beverly Cleary, Judy Bloom. She's not Sidney Johnson of the all of a kind family fame. She's not Maud Hart Lovelace, who we're going to get to in a minute. But something has kept Betsy alive, at least to the degree she is for that long. And the answer might be in those blog posts from the Free Library of Philadelphia. The Free Library of Philadelphia is where the Carolyn Haywood papers are housed. It's common when an author dies for their papers, such as letters, manuscripts, and so on, to be donated to a research library and cataloged. A lot of people research children's book authors, and I am extraordinarily grateful that they do. I'm currently reading um, The Collected Letters of Ursula Nordstrom, which is made possible by such collections. So I appreciate that they exist because there's a lot of research done that creates a lot of great books out of such things. The Children's Literature Research Collection at the Free Library of Philadelphia was the recipient of the papers of Carolyn Haywood. She was a Philadelphia native. In a two-part blog series, which I'll link to in the show notes, a librarian from the Free Library of Philadelphia wrote about a discovery the library made when they were cataloging those papers of an unpublished manuscript from 1979. So remember, Betsy was written 1939 to 1977, Her other best-known series is about a little boy named Eddie, written in a similar time period. Um, Ms. Haywood wrote books into the 80s. So this is an unpublished manuscript written in 1979. The blog post goes into the usual criticism of Haywood, which is that her books are shallow, they're sugary, they create an idealized world that never really existed, aimed at children who didn't wish to be challenged. And all of that is very true. But the blog post disclosed that in the 1970s, shortly after the publication of the last Betsy book, which is Betsy's Play School, I did not deem all of Betsy worth revisiting for this episode, but I do dimly remember Betsy's Play School being one of my favorite in the series. It's sort of an early precursor to the Babysitter's Club. Carolyn Haywood wrote a manuscript called Junior, which was much darker, much more real, and much grittier than anyone would have thought her capable of. Remember... This woman wrote over almost five decades. She came into prominence in the 1940s when children's literature was more moralistic, more closely controlled by adults than it would later become. We've talked about on the show of this transformation children's literature went through in the middle part of the 20th century when it really began to feature real kids and feature kids being naughty and kids being kids and getting away from your very good girl good boy, Dick and Jane narratives that are sort of the roots of children's literature, especially for young children. Carolyn Haywood's career ran right through that era, but her writing, for the most part, stayed from that earlier time, all the way into the 80s. Why? It's really hard to know. Um, The Free Library of Philadelphia speculates in the blog post, maybe it was because she had no children of her own, which she didn't. Maybe, I mean, she herself was well-traveled and well-educated, but maybe she was just naive about the real lives of children, or maybe it wasn't worth the risk. She was finding success with these books. You know, there are a lot of authors that get into this, that what they do is formulaic, but it works, and so they stick with the formula. Why change? Why take the chance? And that question, why take the chance, is ultimately the problem with this book looking back on it. It suited the needs of my six-year-old self perfectly. Setting aside some really bad portrayals of Native Americans in a unit where the kids in this school study them, which is unfortunately really typical of books of this era. That doesn't excuse it, but it's true. It's a decent... Setting that aside, and that's definitely problematic, and if you're going to pick up this book, especially with a child, you should be well aware that that's coming. But setting that aside... It's a decent run-of-the-mill story about a little girl who starts school. You've read many. Many like it. She makes a best friend. She gets lost. 
She has a misunderstanding with her mother. I even really like the portrayal of her mother-daughter relationship. But to me, that's the thing that feels most real about this book, which is why I'm not buying the Ms. Haywood didn't write children well because she didn't have children of her own. I think she understands more than she gets credit for. I think she's just not fleshing it out. There's no risk. The book doesn't age well. It doesn't become a classic. It doesn't get remembered because neither it nor the character within it takes a risk, grows, stretches, or becomes more than really... And I didn't go back and read them all, I'll admit. But really, over the course of all 12 books, she doesn't really do any of that. There's room for it if Haywood had wanted to write it that way. There's a chapter where a little boy who seems to be different from the rest, I think in a book written today, we might be wondering when we read him, is there ADHD or something going on there? And he gets in trouble. It feels like he needs fleshing out, like he should be more understood. But he's not explained. In this world, characters who are naughty get punished by sitting in the corner. That's what happens. Betsy's best friend, Ellen, has a hard time having a birthday party because her father works nights and must sleep during the day. It seems like there's room for some exploration here, too. Is there a class difference going on? Is Ellen's mom also a working mom? Is there a dynamic happening in this family? What does dad even do for a living? None of that's explained, although the birthday party is really carefully fleshed out. In short, there's really no good reason to spend a lot of time in Betsy's world. I'm glad it was there for me when I needed early chapter books. And in some ways, I'm glad it's still there for girls who may need it. It it frustrates me because I feel like it's not going to be found. If there is an audience today that needs this book, it's people in the same phase of life that I'm in who can read okay but need some of those early plot chapter books. And they're not going to find it, unfortunately, at least not at my library, because we are stuck in those leveled reading systems that force kids to read at a certain numeric level. And while this is not a difficult book to decode, old books, simply because of their language, fall in higher number ranges. So that's frustrating. But bottom line, there is a difference between the characters who make up the world and those who change it. And that brings us to an entirely different Betsy. And that Betsy was handed to me at a different time. So on its face... Betsy Tacey is a very similar to book to be is for Betsy. It was published one year later. It came out in 1940. Betsy is five years old. Very similar to the Haywood Betsy. The main focus of the book is Betsy making her best friend, Tacey, and the adventures the two of them go on together, including starting school. But when you get beyond the basics of plot, there's really no comparison between these two books. It would be like comparing your grandmother's chicken soup with Campbell's. They have the same name, and both, in theory, will provide you lunch, but beyond that, they're not really related. Maud Hart Lovelace based the character of Betsy on herself, growing up in small-town Minnesota in the 1890s and early 1900s. They started as bedtime stories for her daughter. Lovelace was an older mom. She gave birth to her only child in 1931 when she was 39. I can relate to this. My oldest was born when I was 35, and... I am preparing the summer to deliver my younger child a few months before I turn 40. So I can relate to this being an older mom. The Betsy Tacey stories really meant to live as bedtime stories for her daughter. She never really envisioned publishing them. And when she did, she didn't envision making it into a series. But she did. There was demand for Betsy's stories, and that kept her writing. And she would ultimately publish 10 books in the series. So the first thing that sets Betsy apart is the reality. This is period writing. Lovelace was working on capturing the feel of an earlier time for her child. And so the details are there. The boys and girls playground at school, all the little things about this horse and buggy era, and so on. It's not in this book, but there's a memorable chapter later in the series when Betsy's in high school that describes her and her sister getting ready to go swimming. And the descriptions of their bathing suits is just insane. They're wearing these surge bathing suits that go over underwear and they have cap sleeves and they go to the knee and they wear them with stockings and lace up canvas shoes. They're going swimming. (laughs) This is what they have to wear to literally jump in the lake and go swimming. In some ways, Lovelace is doing what Laura Ingalls Wilder does so well in her book. She's taking her readers deep into this era, but she's not doing it in a way that's I'm teaching you what it's like to live in the Edwardian time. She's doing it in the, this is the girl, this is what's happening, and there's some detail in there that gives that that period feel to it. 
The other thing that Lovelace does that is very Wilder-esque is she grows this character from a five-year-old child to, by the end of the series, Betsy is a grown-up married woman. And Betsy's voice, just like Laura's voice, we talked about this when we talked about the Little House books, expands just as her voice grows and you you hear a more fleshed out version of it. These stories are like Little House. They're in third person. They're not first person, but they're third person limited. So you're seeing Betsy's point of view and her point of view is broadening as her world is broadening from her neighborhood to her town and beyond. As I said before, I don't revisit the early Betsy books. I sort of split this, this series kind of in half in my head. It's not quite in half. The first four books happen when Betsy is little, sort of under 12, starting when she's five in this book. And then there's there's three more books. And then with book five, which I think is Heavens to Betsy. I don't have it in front of me. She goes to high school. And so I think of the four high school books, there's one for each high school year. And then there's two beyond high school as the second half of the series. I revisit those a lot more than I do the early ones, which is why if you go to my Goodreads account and you're looking for my reviews of the Betsy books, you'll see Betsy Tasty because I just read it for this episode and you'll see the fifth to the 10th books of the series, which I read quite a lot, but I haven't reviewed those kind of three other little Betsy books because I haven't read them in a really long time and I will. But when I went to spend time in the world of younger Betsy for this episode, I was worried it would disappoint and it doesn't. The groundwork for who Betsy will be is laid out right here in this book. Betsy the best friend, drawing bashful Tacey out of her shell, but understanding better than most do what lies underneath Tacey's shy surface. Betsy the little sister, who has a complicated relationship with eight-year-old Julia that will grow into the wonderful friendship they will have in later books. Betsy the storyteller, with the imagination, who will become Betsy the writer as the series goes on. This was never meant to be a series when this book was written, but you'd never know it. And that is the hallmark of somebody writing a character who's very real. He doesn't have to go backwards and fill in gaps because she's fleshed this character out so completely from the beginning. So Betsy's adventures in this book, when she's little, feel infinitely more real than those of the other Betsy. She doesn't just exist in her world, she defines it. She and Tacey make discoveries in this book. They, so they find sacred spaces that only little kids can. They find a box that they make into a store, that they make into a house. They find this beautiful apple tree that, you know, only little kids can turn everyday spaces into sacred ones. They also deal with very real world stuff. The death of Tacey's baby sister is in here, as is the birth of Betsy's. It's just hard to imagine Haywood's Betsy having the depth of emotion to deal with such things. But then again, I think of myself when I was reading them, Bland Betsy didn't bother me. Bland Betsy, who I read first. Bland Betsy taught me to read chapter books. Bland Betsy taught me to absorb the details of a book. So when I got to this and the irresistible Betsy Warrington Ray came along, I was ready for it. I'm so glad that these came to me in the order that they did. So as Lovelace's series goes on, it will stay small town and comfortable, and you absolutely will want to spend time with Betsy's family and have Sunday night lunch with them. But it isn't afraid to get real around the edges. These books are not edgy, at all. They're very safe, they're very tame, but they aren't set in a perfect world. There will be more tough stuff that Betsy's friends and neighbors will have to deal with. Her high school nemesis, or perhaps love interest Joe, is an orphan who will raise himself. There's a neighbor whose father passes away who has to leave high school early to take care of his family. There's going to be a family friend sent to a sanatorium for tuberculosis. And at some point, Betsy will look around and notice there's a class difference between her family and her best friend, Tacey's, who live in a small house without running water. There's no tragedy here. Betsy's not Joe March. You know, we're not going to shed a quart of tears over Betsy. But she's not B is for Betsy either. She will also meet the Syrian refugees who live just outside her hometown. And there is some, not a lot, but there is some understanding of the world beyond her own that is so refreshing to see in books of this era. The reward for this is that characters like Betsy Warrington Ray get remembered. Haywood's Betsy is nowhere on the internet, but Lovelace's Betsy has her own society, the Betsy Tacey Society. There are legions of fans who visit Mankato, Minnesota, which was Maud Hart Lovelace's hometown, and what Betsy's hometown of Deep Valley is based on, and reissued versions of her high school books with wonderful introductions by famous authors, you should read it, who readily share the influence Betsy has on them. I feel like it's Anna Quinlan who says in one of them that 
The two authors whose work she's reread the most times in her life are Maud Hart Lovelace and Charles Dickens. Pretty good company. Her influence on authors also reminds me of one of the things I love most about Betsy. She was the first of my childhood literary heroines who wanted to write. In Betsy Tacey, she's already making up stories. She's five. She will later make herself a writing desk out of her actor uncle's trunk and craft stories, which by the end of the series she'll be selling. She is, in short, a much more dedicated writer than I am. And she learns the hard way that she must stay devoted to her craft. As a writer and storyteller, she is an inspiration to me. I think I still have a lot to learn from Betsy. But, really, one of the first lessons she and, yes, another fictional little girl named Betsy taught me is that sometimes one of the best things for you is having exactly the right book at exactly the right time. I hope you enjoyed this book pairing and my journey into the way back of my reading history. It is now time for me to announce the summer series I've been hinting at to tell you where we go from here. I have been thinking a lot. This show and other things have caused me to think about the major literary influences on me as a child. Some we've covered. Betsy is a big one. Laura Ingalls Wilder is a big one. And some we do need to get to. I mentioned The Wizard of Oz earlier, Ramona, The Great Brain. But it's hard to name any literary character that has had as big an influence on my life as Anne of Green Gables. And I've been thinking for a while about how to cover Anne of Green Gables. And I've realized she's more than a one-episode character for me. I need to get deep with Anne in order to figure out what she really means. The timing seems right. Because Anne is celebrating her 110th anniversary this year, and there was a big new TV series a couple months ago featuring her, and she just seems to be everywhere right now. So as I in my life i am shifting focus more towards home and getting ready for a new baby, it seemed to be a great summer to focus on Anne. So that's what we're going to do. The plan is this summer, in June, July, and August, we're going to release a five-part series all about the Anne books. Now, we're going to do book pairings. I am pairing each of these books up with something, and I'm pretty sure I have figured out my list. But I would love to hear what you would put your favorite Anne book with. And remember, we are wide open here. We can do fiction, nonfiction, children's books, picture books, no matter. I'm doing five because there were five Anne books I wanted to talk about. The series, the Anne of Green Gables series, actually runs eight books long. Kind of nine, but that's nine is a whole other thing. So let's go with eight books long, because that's the standard. And they vary widely in quality. None of them are bad. But the thing about Anne is she was a moneymaker for not just Lucy Maud Montgomery, but her editors. And they kept begging her for more Anne, even when she was done writing Anne. So there's no question that the books that were written later, the quality goes down, because she's focused on other things. So I'm going to go through Anne the way I recommend to people that they do it if they are going into the series cold. So if you've read Anne, awesome. I hope you'll come along on an Anne reading journey with me. If you've not read Anne and you want to read Anne, this is how I do it. The first three are Anne of Green Gables, Anne of Avonlea, and Anne of the Island. They make a really good trilogy. Each one of them stands alone, but they make a really good trilogy covering this kind of early history of Anne's life. And so my advice, people, is always read the first one. If you like it, read the next two in order. Finish the trilogy because it's beautiful. And if you do nothing else, if you want to say you've read this series, read those three. And that will give you a good background. The fourth book is Anne of Windy Poplars. It was written much later. I actually really like this book. If we really enjoy doing this series, we might come back and pair Windy Poplars with something. But for right now, we're going to skip it. The fifth one... Anne's House of Dreams is was written after Anne of the Island. It's one I've come to appreciate more in life, and we're going to make it the fourth of our series. It was the fourth one written. So, so far, we're following the series in the order it was written. The sixth one, Anne of Ingleside, was the last one written. It was written much later. It's the weakest link. It just doesn't have the specialness this series deserves. I'm skipping it. I always recommend first-time readers of the series skip it. If you love the series and you get to the end of it and you can't handle anything but more Anne, by all means, go back and read it. But seriously, if you're going to skip one, skip that one. Seven and eight are Rainbow Valley and Rilla of Ingleside. So if you're reading the series in the order it was written, you would do Green Gables, Anne of Avonlea, Anne of the Island, Anne's House of Dreams, Rainbow Valley, and Rilla of Ingleside. But I'm skipping Rainbow Valley. It's not a bad book. It just doesn't hit my top picks. I don't love it. 
But I do, and I think I'm in the minority here in terms of what I've read from Anne fans. I actually really like Rilla of Ingleside, so I'm going to cover that one too. As always, reading along is never required. I hope you'll tune in for some passionate book talk. I promise not to do big spoilers. I promise not to ruin these for you if you someday do want to read them. But if you want to read the series along with us, here is your reading order. Anne of Green Gables, Anne of Avonlea, Anne of the Island, Anne's House of Dreams, and Rilla of Ingleside. I think some of the pairings will surprise you. But for the first one, we're going to keep it pretty simple. This is the only one I'm going to do this for, but we're actually going to pair Anne of Green Gables with another L.M. Montgomery book. Because just for this first episode of the series, I want to really go deep with this author and the impact she had, as well as the impact her life had on her work. So we're taking two of her best known main characters and we're putting Anna Green Gables together with Emily of New Moon. And from there, the parents are going to get more original and we'll announce them as we go. So our next episode is going to be Anna Green Gables with Emily of New Moon. All things L.M. Montgomery. The goal is to finish this by the end of the summer. I did mention we're having a new baby, so I'm intentionally keeping the schedule flexible. And all I will promise you is I will get those to you as fast as I can get them out well and do it right. But I'm looking forward to spending the summer talking about Anne with you guys. And I really have no idea what this podcasting journey is going to look like as the family moves on to its new phase, but I'm excited about it. Speaking of this podcasting journey, I wanted to take just a couple of minutes right here at the end, as we wrap things up, to celebrate where we've been, because it has been a journey. I launched No Extra Words as the Flash Fiction Podcast on May 29th, 2015. The first three episodes were short stories I wrote myself, and in the first week, I had 14 people listen. On June 1st, 2016, I released our anniversary episode, and it was our 50th episode. We had also done seven specials up to that point, including our four-part Contributor Appreciation Month author interviews, and that Christmas we had released the Christmas serial, the four-part Christmas serial for the holiday season. At that point, we had shared writing by over 100 author contributors. And so for the 50th episode, we did our first rebroadcast. We went back in the archives and shared two of your favorite stories from the first year. On May 25th, 2017, I released our second anniversary episode. That was an ambitious project. It featured 12 100-word drabbles, by far the most contributors we had ever had in one episode, as well as an interview and a 100-word story of my own. In our second year, we had released 32 episodes in five specials, including our celebration of podcasts, a reworking of our Christmas serial, and we had introduced the Writer Spaces segment. By that point, we had shared work by over 180 different writers, many more than once, and that episode launched our Drabbles on Instagram series. Today, we are releasing our third anniversary episode. This year, we've released 30 episodes and seven specials, including a special I did off the top of my head a couple of days ago, our Drabble on Instagram series, and our National Novel Writing Month series. I also did some reimagining of what the show looked like. And took you into this, our second season. And people still ask me, my best friend asked me just a couple weeks ago, why did you change formats? Why weren't you doing flash fiction anymore? Didn't you like flash fiction? Weren't you getting submissions? And the only answer I can give you is it was time. I've realized in three years of doing this, that this podcast is my canvas and I have to paint what I'm inspired by. Otherwise it just doesn't work. So for those of you who have joined us since season two, thank you for being here. I'm so glad that this format resonates. For those of you who've been with us through this whole long journey, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, you guys. Thank you so much for still being here. I can't believe you've made it. Through a name change, a format change, we've shared work by over 200 authors. We've collaborated with other podcasters, become a part of a podcasting community, which is wonderful. And I have no idea what's ahead. I do have some goals. Um... I would like to launch a business, a proofreading and editing business under the name No Extra Words. I would love to do that in 2019. Working on some plans for how to make that happen. Um, I told my husband I've always wanted to launch a book group, but I feel like doing that at the same time as having a baby is probably a bad idea. So that one is still percolating in my head. I would love to launch a Goodreads book club, maybe for adults who love picture books or something low pressure like that. But most of all, what I want to do is I want to continue to bring you all great content. You all have been part of this journey. And if you're still listening, 
man, you have been a dedicated listener. You've been a cheerleader, friend, advocate, contributor, whatever role you've played. Thank you. And thank you for pressing play. Tens of thousands of times people have pressed play on this show. And I may not have any idea why, but thank you. If the show means something to you, and I'm guessing at this 40-some-odd minute mark, it does, it means the world to me when you share it with a friend. I also love it when you reach out to me. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, or Goodreads. And tell me what you're up to in literary land and what you think of all this. Links to all of those connections and show notes are on our website, noextrawords.wordpress.com. I am so looking forward to being back with you soon to talk all things Anne, which I could do all summer, and it sounds like I'm gonna do all summer. But until then, I hope you go out in the world and find yourselves a good story.